So today I'm going to tell you a couple stories. I like telling stories, and it's going to be details of uh, a couple machine learning projects that we've done um, with my team at Pythian for uh, two customers. And we were talking publicly about this. So one of the customers is the Tech Resources, one of the largest mining company uh, in the world and the largest in Canada. This is uh, the machine that we've been working on, predicting uh, when they're actually going to fail. Uh, that's me and Paul down there. They're so big. Paul is sitting right there. He's so small. So you can see the proportions, right? Um, and another project I'm going to talk about is how we're analyzing the cricket uh, uh, match videos to extract certain information out of them. So it's a completely different you know, uh, machine learning application. But there's many common themes that we're going to go uh, through. And uh, I think uh, you're going to take uh, quite a few insights out of those. And of course, we've build those uh, on, uh, on GCP. So, and if something doesn't work today, I apologize. This presentation style is a little new. We've done it before once, so it kind of works. So I think it'll be cool. Um, so a little bit about Pythian. Uh, Pythian is a 20 years old company. We help uh, customers to innovate with data and uh, with the cloud. Specifically, our machine learning uh, practice is um, helping build real world AI solutions. And that couple of those we're going to look at uh, today, including some details. One of those projects, actually, the one for the uh, ECB, we submitted for the Partner of the Year Award, and it was selected. So yesterday, we actually got a Partner of the Year Award in uh, um, data analytics. So that's when I've been uh, on the stage uh, receiving it. Um, a little bit about me. Um, hi, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a cloud CTO today. I've been at Pythian for 13 years, been doing a lot of different things, from you know running a team of database engineers to creating a new business in a new region. Um, and uh, today, um, I, I'm a cloud CTO as well as run our machine learning practice. So uh, and Pythian is a uh, you know, very known uh, pr premier partner uh, of Google. We have uh, four specializations and do a lot of cloud migrations, uh, help customers build data systems and uh, AI solutions in the, in the Google Cloud. All right, so a little bit about tech. So tech is, as I mentioned already, Canada's largest diversified resource company. It's a fashionable way to say mining company. Um, and they're very modern, uh, very modern. And all of those devices, are, are, are equipment in the mines, actually are big IoT devices today. So specifically, what we're going to focus on is on those babies. This is a Komatsu 930E uh, hauling trucks. And it's about $1 million uh, uh, dollars truck, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's quite big. It's quite big, as you've seen on a, on a picture. So Basically, what we're going to look today is that uh, we're going to look at the, how can we predict the failure of those machines. Because cost of failure is actually quite large. A single failure, electrical uh, uh, subsystem failure, and we focused on that today, actually costs anywhere between 100,000 to several millions to fix. And the cost uh, comes from two things. One of them is that cost of repair, like a direct repair. Um, and the earlier we can spot the potential problem and uh, initiate the repair, uh, the less usually this repair cost. But the biggest cost actually come, come from being, the truck being idle. Because in, in resource constraint environment, when the truck doesn't haul coal or doesn't haul stone rock, we don't get any, any revenue. Right? So that's where the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest cost coming from. So predicting failure allows us to do this uh, uh, maintenance and repair at a time when we're not resource constrained, so we reduce uh, or eliminate this idling cost, right? So again, what do we need? We need an early warning, right? We need an early warning, and uh, ideally, we want to know how much time until the truck gonna fail, right? That would be our nirvana. Um, or depending on some other types of failure, we want to know a level of underperformance, how deteriorated the resource or a component is, so we can decide which ones we take for the proactive maintenance. First, so they estimated that if you can uh, predict uh, uh, electrical uh, high voltage uh, electrical uh, subsystem failures, then they could save up to four million a year uh, just with this uh, failure alone, right? And it's uh, scoping on the three mining sites with 108 trucks like this. So now we have a kind of problem and we have a need, and we always try to be very disciplined and establishing those first before we're moving towards machine learning solutions because it allows us to have a full circle and estimate you know, uh, ROI of our work as well. Now, what's the data we're working with? So there's a several, you know, data set inputs that we're going to work with, uh, data sets we're going to work with. But one of them is that, hey, where do we get predictive data in order to spot the things, in order to spot the patterns that indicate a, a pending failure, right? So um, 
those uh, tracks equipped with uh, sensors uh, that you know, send the readings as a you know, time series data, as well as alerts and events which are generated uh, on those tracks from you know, actuators, from the, the smart systems embedded in those as well. There's some dispatch data and some other data sources available as well. But ultimately, we're going to work only with the time series data uh, uh, here. And uh, each track generates about 2 gigabytes of data per day and you know, hundreds of uh, thousand uh, data points per track per second, um, approximately. Now, so obviously, this is where our big data coming from, right? We've been working with the four years of historical data available today. Um, three mining sites, uh, more than 100 trucks, millions of alerts, billions of sensor reading. And it definitely must be a machine learning problem, right? We have a large enough data set. But you know, what do we do with this? Uh, before I go further, I want to kind of take a step back and uh, share with you our learning that over the years of you know, building AI solutions, we've always tried to narrow down our problem as a supervised learning problem, right? Because it allows us to measure how well we're doing historically. It allows us to give a, convinci a, a convincing insight to end user. It's a very actionable result as opposed to things like an anomaly detection. When you say something seems wrong with this truck, and so what? There's a thousands of components of this truck, right? Or you know, try to create uh, some clustering and figure out certain patterns on it. There's so many patterns, but most of them have nothing to do with electrical failures that we're going to look at, right? So as a result, we always try to narrow down the problem in some way and state it as a supervised learning problem when we have a known actionable outcome that we can you know, predict with a model, whether it's a classification or a regression type of problem, right? Now, where do we get the labels? Well, the maintenance, historical maintenance data, and the historical database of the spare parts, and so on. The trouble is that some of this data has not actually been digitized. So this is where their analysts, their maintenance analysts, had to go back for a few years, go through uh, all the data, and actually uh, extract some of the failure and pre predictive uh, or preventive uh, repair um, information and supply uh, uh, those. Now, we had so much data. It's great, but what about those failures themselves? Well, this is where small data comes in. And the small data in this case, we have only really a few dozen failure events. Right? There were 31 catastrophic high voltage failures of those 108 trucks, or at least 31 that they could find. Um, and you know, a few dozen uh, events that are resulting in uh, suspension exchanges or recharges, so called, when it's deteriorating, and then pump it up so it works a little longer. And most of those actually went undocumented at all. So as a result, this is the most important data that we normally take into our projects. And this is the data that seemed to have the lowest quality, right? So we had less certainty, less certainty. We, we have not as much certainty that some events are not missing from there, right? So we have to be very careful how we use that, how we use that. Now, does it smell like a machine learning problem still when we work, only work with the dozens of events? So it's very hard to build a model on 30 events or so, right? So what do we do? Well, in general, like as we move forward, as we have you know, a business need, as we understand our you know, data at least a little bit, we need to frame the problem. As I said, usually we always try to, to narrow down on a supervised learning, which is as a regression and classification. Then we'll need to understand how to produce reliable labels if they're not available, right? Modeling techniques to use, and you know, work on a feature engineering. So those are general kind of directions that, we, that we're following. Now, um, let's say what we want to predict is, let's start with an obvious. We just want to predict time to failure. This would be great. We know exactly when, uh, according to the model, uh, the resource is going to fail, component is going to fail. But it's really hard to build that, right? Because there's a very few samples. And other than just um, training the model to find out whether, some, whether failure is going to happen or not, we now need to distinguish whether it's going to happen one day from now, seven days from now, or 20 days from now, which is a significantly harder problem to do. And uh, some failure types actually are not developing in progressive fashion at all, right? So um, we won't be able even to say whether it's one day or seven days. Uh, so as a result, we had to kind of go back and look at the problem again. And what we normally do, we always try to look at the problem from the uh, eyes of their human uh, who are already doing the work today, ideally, if that's possible. Now, in this case, the asset health supervisors, what they do is that many times a day, they look at their dashboard, some kind of heuristic rules, and so on, and make a guess. I think this thing is going to fail. I'll need to take it for the maintenance. 
But what they do ultimately is they take observations and make some kind of conclusions using whatever human insight and their knowledge that they have, right? So that features us two things. It's great that we can now have those observations many times a day. It's much more than just 30 failures we need to work with. But we don't have those observations historically. The good news is we can simulate them from the failure uh, uh, events that we have. And I'll show how we do that. And uh, another uh, um, uh, thing that we learned is that it's actually not really important to know exactly when the failure is going to happen. It's enough to say that it's going to happen soon, soon enough. And within soon enough, it's usually for them needs to be a few days. Right, you know, day in advance, maybe a little late, but four days, seven days is awesome. So that's what we learned. Now, how do we reframe this problem? So, and this is a, you know, one of the maybe most kind of innovative approach, uh, the most creative thing we've done during the, during this project. So um, we basically transform our events that we have from the uh, maintenance analysts that they provided us into certain observations. So how do we do that? So this is a. Um, let me make sure I'll... All right. So this is a, a timeline, right, for each truck. And there's some trucks that had no failures at all, so this timeline would be clean without events. This is a failure event. This is a maintenance event when uh, staff decided to took the truck uh, out and because they thought there would, be, there would be a problem and they fixed it. But all of those is indicating for us that there's something wrong. So what we can do, we work with them in order to say, all time in the you know, lifetime of a truck, we're going to split in a certain ranges. The range before the failure of a certain length, we're going to call as a failure pending range, or the failure range, or a bad range. This is where we're going to make observations every day, a few times a day, and these observations will be labeled as one, which in our case meaning a failure pending within this period of time. However long it is, seven days, 10, I think we ended up with the seven days uh, in the end. Now, there's also some period of time when there may be still a signal because, you know, it, the, the, the failure may develop uh, earlier, but maybe not. So there's kind of an area when there's uncertainty in the data. We're not sure whether there's a strong signal or not. So we decided to mark those, um, uh, those ranges and exclude them from taking observations. So we have a much cleaner deline delineation between there's a failure pending soon, and there's a clean zone when we don't expect failure, for example, over the next month or so. Right? So as a result, we basically have those clean ranges marked as a, as a green, and then the red ranges marked as failure pending. And uh, sometime after the failure was fixed, because the way that we generating labels, as you, uh, labels uh, data, uh, features as you, as you learn later, we also exclude it from consideration. Right? So what's important here, uh, to remember is that basically we simulated a human observations, right? The, way, the same way they try to spot the problem. And at, this, at each of those points in time, we kind of make an observation and take the data we know at that t by, by that time uh, from our time series data and generate some features that we're going to fit in the model. And model will basically be trained on whether it's observations from a clean range or from the failure pending range. That's it. Right? So what we've done is that we basically interpolated dozens of rare events into hundreds of thousands of uh, observations. And you know, thousands of observations is already something we can work with and build the model on, right? although still not a huge amount. right? So we have to be uh, quite careful. Now, so what do we do next? You know, an obvious way of working with time series data, are, uh, you know, uh, as Paul would tell me, is like, hey, we build an RNN model. It's obviously designed to like, get a sequence of, you know, either of alerts and sensor readings or some aggregate of those, and then um, you know, make, a, make a prediction based on those. But we end up with a huge feature space, like tens of thousands uh, 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 points, only for a few thousand labels. So what we're going to end up with is what's kind of known as the dimensionality course when, uh, curse. When we use a too complex uh, uh, feature space or too complex model, and there uh, um, we can obviously train the model on those, and it may show a great, uh, um, uh, a great result on training. But on the uh, testing it, uh, it will not generalize, and it, uh, the, the error will be huge. Uh, and it will basically definitely learn certain patterns. But there are so many patterns in data that will most likely learn something else than electrical, uh, electrical failures. And it's definitely what we've, what we've seen. 
So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with a relatively few samples and a, a, a huge feature space? Well, to fix that, there's a few things. One of them, we need to control our model complexity and not go crazy with uh, creating complicated uh, neural networks, for example. And we also should try to reduce our feature space, right? Uh, we already tried to simplify the problem by going away from regression to a binary classification. That's as simple as we can get. Um, so what do we do next? Now, in order to reduce the feature space, uh, we should be working more creatively on the feature engineering than just you know, feed a sequence, right? So if we want to employ some of the automated kind of dimensionality reduction techniques, in this case, it didn't quite work because the data is not distributed normally. Um, but what we did is that we worked with uh, 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 domain experts and uh, you know, understood how we can embed you know, a temporal effect into our features uh, made from sensors and alerts without actually having to work with a full sequence you know, of uh, tens of thousands of uh, data points. So what we've done is that is basically at each time that we make observation, we have this historical data available up to that point. So what we've done is that we defined a several like a sliding ranges of you know, hours or days, and some of them even like shifted back. Right? And we created an aggregate from those alerts and the sensors, and alerts, the count of alerts within those ranges worked actually the best in this case. And uh, the sizes of those you know, ranges, as well as the offset, is what we've actually been tuning as part of the hyperparameter tuning. So we turn our feature engineering parameters into kind of hyperparameters as well, right? What we also uh, 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 been doing is that uh, when I was mentioning on um, um, how we created those ranges, the sizes of those ranges we actually also made tunable. So our hyperparameter tuning iterations was not only on the model; it was on a complete feature uh, 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 feature engineering uh, pipeline as well as on a label production pipeline, right? So that we can. We can, we can tune that and understand whether it's going to work best when we have a four days window, a seven days window, and how far back we'll need to consider pushing this clean, clean range as well, right? Um, if you, you know, got more detailed questions, like you'll find me at the booth for the rest of the day, so um, he'll come up here and we can talk about it. Now, because we're taking uh, our future engineering uh, parameters as well as labeling uh, parameters into um, as part of our kind of tuning cycle, uh, hyperparameter tuning cycle, we need to be careful how we, you know, do a split on the training and testing, right? What's important is that we need to split uh, in such a way that a failure event and the windows resulting from, failure, from this failure event will either be only in a training set or in a, in a, in a, in a testing set. Because otherwise, otherwise we, uh, we may cheat by basically artificially tuning uh, those labeling uh, 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 windows. And uh, we may also introduce um, a problem because an, a nearby observations you know, from today and from yesterday will include data you know, from the last maybe 10 days or 15 days, depending on those ranges, right? So they may be very similar, so we need to make sure that we don't uh, you know, use them in the training and testing because it, it, it's kind of you know, cheating in this case, right? So we we'll be very careful that when we split the data, we actually split it by events before we start doing any transformations and any tuning, right? So it's very important not to, not to pollute it in, in this way. Now, also we had to take care of not learning individual trucks because there were some trucks, actually most trucks did not have any failures. We had 108 trucks and 31 electrical failures and some of the trucks failed more than once, right? So as a result, we had to be careful and not to learn from the, those uh, 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 huge amount of alerts and sensors the patterns that are truck specific. Right? So as a result, we had to you know, include trucks, uh, um, um, obviously, that had no failures and pick up some of the clean observations from them. Right? We need to include trucks that never failed in training but failed in testing sets, so we cover those as well. So those, things we, those are the things we need to uh, think about. You know, of course, when uh, um, you know, building models that generalize as well uh, um, also means that you know, we're not uh, uh, just spotting a pattern that's uh, um, that we're not interested in, which is you know, actually learning the truck or learning the mining side, for example, if it ends up that one side had more failures than, than, uh, than another. Now, how do we control model complexity? Well, if we stick to uh, like a neural network, then we'll just use highly regularized neural networks. But you know, it's quite a bit of effort. And the good news is that you know, there's uh, algorithms that are very robust on this relatively 
uh, small data sets with relatively high number of features, you know, boosted trees, random forest. We actually ended up with a random forest model in the end that worked really well for us. That worked really, really well for us. And uh, uh, so that's basically how we, how we approach the modeling techniques. Now, something to share is that what we've also done, what we've also done is that we applied additional smoothing on the output of the model. So in this case, this is basically observations. Uh, uh, this is time, right? This is uh, the uh, a model uh, output, which is basically we can simplify it as probability of the failure, although it's slightly different, you know, how you treat this uh, uh, after random forest as an output. But for the end users, that's the easiest way to, 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 to present it, right? And then, um, and it's a little spiky, right, as you see. This is where the failure happened in the past, right? So as you can see, uh, the model actually some days before started to produce uh, the probability of failure started to grow, right, uh, based on the model. Uh, based on the model. But it was a little spiky, so as a result, we decided to smooth it. Uh, it's a better user experience as well, allows us to remove some of the potential noisiness uh, uh, from, the, from the model as well. And as you can see, you know, when the failure uh, was you know, dealt with, uh, dealt with uh, the model um, uh, um, prediction started showing uh, the, the lower uh, probability as well. Now, how do we choose the threshold? Uh, at, at which we make a decision, you know, that it's likely pending failure or not. If we choose it very high, then we can miss the event or get, uh, miss the failure or get notified very late for it. If we choose it very low, that we'll have too many, you know, false positives and the engineers will constantly need to make a decision to take the track out for maintenance, right? So knowing what's the average cost of failure and uh, knowing what the maintenance, uh, uh, what the checkup costs, uh, uh, we basically could quickly build a, 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 um, a formula that will allow us to, you know, calculate how much money we're going to save based on the different threshold in here. So it turned out that uh, the optimal, uh, optimal was around this uh, uh, 0 0.5. Now, when we put it in production, we've took into account another aspect, a human aspect of interpretation. And the human aspect is this. Those asset health supervisors spend their life or most of their life doing this, right? And if we, and model ultimately will predict, will make some false positive, will indicate a failure when they won't be one happening, right? So we want to make sure at the very beginning is that we give them experience that will make them more confident. So as a result, we'd rather miss some failures sometimes, but make sure that when they see the alert, when they, when they see the critical condition, they do react. So as a result, we choose it a little bit higher, a little bit higher for them to be, uh, to be more confident in it. And that worked actually really, really well, although we did miss some failures. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the result a little bit later. Now, of course, we build it all on the Google Cloud Platform. This is a kind of a simplified um, way how we, in the end, architected the production system. But basically, whenever we build a, a system like this, um, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find, you know, what's our integration between our AI solution with the rest of the world? How do we get the data and how do we get predictive insights into the customer's hand? Now, Tech Resources has been basically uh, managing most of the stuff uh, on-prem, and we've built it in the cloud. So as a result, you know, of course, we've set up a data uh, um, ingestion pipeline with them. And actually, later on, uh, we've introduced uh, uh, data... F uh, later on, the data flow was introduced versus... Uh, um, versus um, uh, how we worked here with a, a, a cloud composer uh, and, and Airflow. But um, in the end, we've basically been landing data in the cloud storage, which is a very common way of, of, of doing that. And then we had a regular job uh, uh, ingesting the data in a BigQuery, as well as updating uh, some of the um, aggregates in a big table. And the reason we've chose big table is because it's very good for a sparse data. Uh, like tens of thousands uh, uh, um, columns of sparse data that we needed. And it was very useful for us to pre-create a lot of different aggregates with a lot of different averaging windows and a lot of different parameters so we can then quickly sample observations out of them based on whatever lab labeling techniques we're using and sampling different aggregation windows. So we could, we, we could, we could iterate through those very quickly very quickly uh, without recalculating those aggregates uh, every time. So that's why we used a, a, a big table for that, which is kind of unusual in a way. Um, and, you know, in the end, we've developed uh, an API that basically sits in the, in the app engine uh, and uh, behind the Google Cloud endpoint, have a REST endpoint for them to call. 
So all they need to do after all of this implemented is basically, I w tell me at this point in time, what's your prediction that this truck will fail? Or give me predictions for all 108 trucks today or as of five days ago, right? That's basically the API that we gave them. The API behind the scene calculated several, um, uh, made several predictions, applied the smoothing that we need, and threw back up the probability as well as whether it's uh, um, alert conditions or not based on a selected threshold, right? Um, and you know, API basically picked the picks the data from um, um, picks the features from uh, Bigtable, which are updated as part of the data ingestion. It picks the model from the um, um, a cloud storage bucket so that we can update model without you know impacting and restarting our applications and uh, um, present the result uh, as a JSON in the response right so it's not that complicated so all they need to do is that regularly call it regularly call it and get the results in front of users or store them in their own systems uh, and it's very important that we could embed it in their own systems rather than give them something new because asset health supervisors already have a lot of things and dashboards to look at they don't need yet another thing Right? Although it may be somewhat ugly ish, you can argue, it's really in front of the users and what they're using now. And that's very important. And when we build the systems with an API that's exposing an API, um, that allows us this ease of embedding, ease of integration, like as opposed to have very tight, you know, uh, uh, very, very, very tight integration. And you know, as we build it on Google Cloud, we have all the operational metrics in a stack driver and have a dashboard that's showing us exactly what's going on. How much resources used, how many predictions are being made, uh, and et cetera, and et cetera. So very kind of sleek and very easy to use, and it's been running basically on its own with one failure in a, about a year and a half, I think, right? So something got full somewhere, um, and uh, um, and and, and that's why that why that why it failed. It wasn't monitored before. Now, let's look at a specific example. What you know, one of the uh, uh, failures, how it was predicted. So the system they called AID uh, it triggered a warning on Thursday morning. The asset health supervisors made a decision in whatever way they made um, that seems like it's legitimate. Let's take for maintenance. They took for maintenance. They found uh, uh, this uh, contactor, RP1 contactor, that uh, been failing, replaced it. But this is, uh, the, the predictive model still uh, was reporting a pending failure. So they decided to take it back for maintenance and then found another crack in the critical component that normally results in a high voltage system failure, right? Basically, electrical cabinet blow up is, and they blow up in a spectacular way. So, you know, um, and it's expensive. And uh, so they were able to fix that. And then the model uh, uh, kind of uh, then dropped down its prediction to a normal level over time. And it's interesting, even though we trained it on a certain, on a certain range, it turns out that the model was often predicting it a little bit before that range. So having this uncertainty window helped us a lot when we are kind of in the middle, right? It may, gave a much more, much stronger, much more differentiated signal for the model to train on, right? Which is very important for us because we have very few, uh, uh, very few uh, uh, samples, right? Thousands of samples is, is very, very little, uh, very little. So what we focus on, we focus on quality of our labels. We also would like to have a good quality of the features, but you know, to some degree, model can deal with that noise. That's the job of machine learning model in order to deal with that noise, right? Of course, we want to reduce that complexity, but our focus is always quality of labels, right? Um, this is a something that's kind of cool that they told us, you know, four months after what happened, and I read it because I think it's amazing, uh, amazing results. So the work we did with the Komatsu 930E whole truck fleet. Uh, has saved us half a million so far. So we, we put it in place in April of last year, and that was June of uh, this year. And it has so far predicted six electrical cabinet blow-ups. So the model predict predicted six. Now, four of these were actioned. Asset Health Supervisor took a decision, yep, good idea. Two of them were not actioned. Asset Health Supervisor thought that the model doesn't know what it's doing. And they missed it. It caused a failure. Now, one cabinet blow-up was missed. So the model didn't pre predict it, whether because we choose threshold a little too high intentionally or because there was just a failure that was so rapidly developing that there was no pattern for it, right? It's possible to. So and they estimated that it was $3 to $4 million per annum that they, they would save from this use case alone per year. So it's an incredib incredible uh, uh, ROI that we, that we are able to achieve. And Carl, uh, the C CIO, 
um, yesterday evening told me, you know, you know how much we saved this year alone with this? On the 10 truck failures that they successfully predicted and avoided, they saved the 4 million this year alone. So it's actually turned out even better than they, um, than they thought before. The result was even better. So that was the maintenance, uh, um, predictive maintenance use case. Um, again, working with the structured data, structured data, uh, very few events, uh, interested events, and kind of a creating way how we frame this problem as a machine learning problem, right? So now I want to move to um, a cricket game analysis, um, which is pretty cool. We work with the English and Wales um, uh, cricket board. And it's basically a single national uh, governing body for all cricket games in England and Wales. That includes, you know, the top league games as well as, you know, college games and all, you know, everything in, in between. Everything in between. So one of their tedious jobs that their staff is doing is that the analysts need to watch hours and hours of cricket video in order to capture, um, extract information from the games, what happens when the ball is delivered, what type of shot it is, you know, uh, uh, and so on, and, and, all, and all the characteristics, right? So it takes a very long time. It's a very manual work. So um, uh, why don't we try to create a system that will either simplify that um, uh, or basically just analyze uh, and extract all those, all those events, right? So manual analysis of this doesn't quite scale. They usually analyze only the top tier events and the rest they don't because they have just no time and it's not affordable to invest those efforts in, 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 in this, right? Um, and another problem is that they have a group of people and they're all kind of inconsistent. They're all kind of a few seconds apart. Sometimes they make a mistake and so on. So they're actually not very consistent uh, in, 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 in um, analyzing the, the games, right? Now, where do we start? You know, just like I, I skipped that from the uh, tech story, but normally when we come in the beginning, we'll try to make an initial discovery and assessment. What are the realms of possible within the domain we're looking at? What are the potential use cases? And we basically build a mini kind of risk-reward matrix. We look at the feasibility and risks of uh, solving a specific use case as a machine learning, uh, with a machine learning. And then you know, we look at the potential value, and we calculate a certain weighted number. And that gives us an input to an executive and a senior leadership, which of those we need to focus on first. So not very difficult to interpret. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. And uh, it turned out that ball separation use cases basically was the most fundamental. And the reason it's the most fundamental and the most important is that before basically everything else needs to be done, analysts need to look through those hours and hours of footage. And you know, a game over the five days, it's about eight hours of game normally, right? Like this is a first class, you know, a test game, international game. And there's uh, hours of, uh, um, of video, but most of the time is idle as people do nothing. Like there's a 10 seconds basically ball delivery and a 10 seconds, few seconds play that people are really interested in, right? So extracting those out of all those hours will remove a huge amount of overhead right away, right? So that's what we wanted to focus on first. And there was a number of ways how we could do, how we could do that, right? So let's look at the data that we're working with, right? So we kind of know the need in some way, right? So here's our big data. Again, as we, as, 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 we, as we look at this, right? There's a petabyte of unstructured video data, right? There's a tens of thousands uh, of hours of HD video uh, or standard video, depending on the game uh, uh, being captured. And, uh, you know, a five days of footage, you know, up to 40 hours, usually kind of in 20s, is about, you know, 100 to 200 gigabytes worth of data, right? So it's, it's quite a bit to, to work with, right? And, um, you know, other than the normal footage, there's also like a Hawkeye footage available, which is a special camera that's, you know, some of the stadiums equipped that's, you know, tracking the ball, uh, tracking the ball. So it's pretty impressive what they do. But we've been mostly working with just the footage. Now, the footage can be either televised or non-televised. Non-televised footage is done by a cameras installed by analysts somewhere in a static location, and that's it. And the televised footage is what you see on the TV, right? Which is cool. It has commentary. It has overlays. So as a result, we have some additional input other than what's happening in the game itself. We have uh, a data from the overlay that we could possibly use. And we have an audio data which we could also possibly use. And you will see how late it actually helped us a lot. Helped us a lot, right? But basically what happens is that as a cricket game is played, he's a bowler that's running. It's called a run-up. So he runs with the ball, then he finishes and does 
I'm demonstrating really bad for those of you who, who, know, who know cricket, right? I see you smile. But that boy, they release the ball, and then the batsman's here with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a bat, like bang, hits or misses, right? But that's really a very unique moment in the game that we want to spot. It's a very unique position of players. They make very unique movements. And uh, pretty much all televised footages have a very specific scene how they film it from behind as ball are running like this, right? So um, obviously, there must be a way to, you know, to spot those to spot those patterns, right? OK, so now what we have looked at in the very beginning, or we could look in the very beginning, is you know, use some of the pre-trained models. As we're working with Google Cloud, there's a quite a few pre-trained models available. Uh, we looked at the Cloud Video Intelligence API. You know, it has ability to detect scene change. So we can use that as the input in our model to see when the, the shot is changing, so it moves from one to another, which is potentially could help us before this ball delivery happens, um, as well as some annotations. Turned out they're not very useful for us because it basically been always detecting players, like a cricket game or some other ball game and so on, like a stadium and a lot of things, but not quite useful for what we need, right? Uh, the Cloud Vision API you know, also can annotate what it sees on the frame, right? Uh, and it also has an OCR component. An OCR component could allow us to look at those overlays and see when this overlay changes, because overlay changes after the ball delivery happens, right? So that's an interesting thing to know. And we could use speech-to-text API in order to parse commentary and apply maybe some NLP to it. We ended up not doing that, but there was an avenue that was available to us, right? Now, again, remember that we want to present and state the problem as a, a supervised learning problem, right? So it's, uh, it's very important that we always narrow down into this. So, Here's a data that's analyst extract, like a sub snapshot of it, right? For each delivery, there's a line, and it has uh, information of, you know, okay, who is uh, a batsman and a bowler, what type of shot it is, you know, a wicket type, and the timestamp as well, you know, where the ball landed, like, uh, uh, and so on, right? So that's what manual tedious work, right? Unfortunately, we could not use this data reliably simply because the time step that they had could not be matched to offsets in the video in a continuous video, because this continuous video, first of all, it doesn't have a concept of a timestamp. And it's also uh, sometimes you know, fast forwarded and so on. So there was no easy way in order to match those to the locations in video. Plus, they were not very precise. It's always by a by, by few seconds off, right? And we really need to be focusing on those specific seconds of the video, right? So there was a problem. Now, um, before going further, I want to kind of review what we need to solve and how we map it to how we can map it to a machine learning problem. So what we need is we need to take this long footage, cut it into small bits, right? Basically that means we'll need offsets in a video that will indicate where the ball delivery happens. You know, within a few seconds precision. Um, and then from there on we can just cut about, you know, even like 10 seconds frames, which is a 10 seconds fragment, which is, you know, this is usually long enough for the game to be over. So we could also try to train the model to, 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 to find out when the ball, uh, uh, whether the play finished. But you know, we didn't really need to do that. We needed to focus on the, very, on the very beginning, right? So the way that we can kind of study it as a machine learning problem is that we basically need to, to, to look at the either individual frames or a sequence of frames. That's what the video is and then predict whether it looks like this time in the beginning of a ball delivery or not. It's quite specific, again, uh, compared to the rest of the, uh, rest of the recording, the rest of the footage, right? So it must be doable, right? But that's basically how we stated this problem, right? So it's a classification problem. Um, we can potentially do it multi-level classification by you know, having, uh, um, um, you know, by, by predicting whether it looks like the baller is actually just doing a run up before the he before the release whether it's actually the ball was released and traveling in the air towards the the batsman but we didn't need it to be that complicated we just did it binary you know whether it's within this range or not right um so as a frames or a sequence as i said right um now the bonus things available is that hey we can also look in some heuristics from data extractors from overlays as well as use some uh, text processing uh, over the commentary if we, if we really have to. You know, one of those things we actually ended up using. So when we worked with it last, uh, last summer, we first built a very quick AutoML Vision uh, prototype when AutoML Vision was still in alpha. 
and it worked really well for us. So it told us that um, it, it told us that uh, it's very feasible to actually implement a proper system around this. What we've done is we've just created a few uh, thousands, uh, uh, extracted a few thousands of frames, and we labeled them as either a ball event or a non-ball event, which is everything else that looks different, right? And uh, uh, from that alone, the AutoML model was uh, uh, able to achieve quite a good performance, and precision recall was basically around you know 95% uh, percent for that, right? So very quickly, very quickly, we could um, we could uh, you know build a model even just on the frames themselves, right? On the frames themselves. Now there's a replays, there's some highlights, or so sometimes it will make a fa false positives. There's other ways to handle it, but it gives us a good confidence. Okay, it's possible to do, right? We did some just uh, very quick manual labeling. Now, so we've done it. What we've done it in order to make it much more robust is that we needed more labels. The good thing is that these days there's a lot of ways to actually label images uh, uh, and label uh, videos, right? So, and there's many services that uh, you can use, like a crowdsource those uh, specialists. Now. Instead of doing that, we've basically built a very simple interface in order to label the videos and use some of the you know, uh, research students that we crowdsource to, to to do that for us, to help us. Um, now, but what we've also done is a very interesting thing is that we reduced labeling efforts by using a few techniques that allows us to approximately say where in the video they're going to be a ball delivery. And what we use is two things. Is two things. One of those was uh, using uh, Cloud Vision API OCR that you know detected where their overlay changes, uh, and we've basically built some heuristic around this that will say this seems like a ball delivery, right? Um, so that was pretty pretty good, but it was always late by some seconds, 10, 15, 20, because it happens later. And depending on a broadcaster, you know, it, 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 it's different. Overlay is different, and the time shift is different. Uh, other thing we used is that we used the combination of unsupervised learning, clustering, and uh, basically a transfer learning. So what we've done is that, uh, and it's great that we can use those systems available in our ecosystem, but what we took is that we took an inception i3D uh, model that uh, um, um, was trained on the kinetics data set, and it's about 500,000 videos, if I remember, with various uh, uh, human actions um, labeled in them. And that model was trained on that. It, 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 it takes an input as a frame sequence, right? And it produces an output, which is basically a multi-label classifier, right? But what we've done with it is that we stripped the last uh, layers out of this model. And then we ended up with a fragment that basically producing a 600 numeric representation, like a 600 values uh, vector, right? For each sequence that it's fed with. So if you can think of it in a way of that, we took a video sequence, which is, you know, Hundreds by hundreds of uh, per each frame, and we looked at two seconds uh, sequences, so it's you know 50 frames, so it's tens of thousands of uh, numbers times three for RGB channels, right? So we took this and narrowed it down to 600, in a, such a way that it came from a model that was trained to recognize certain human motions, as opposed to in any other random way or using some dimensional introduction technique or whatnot, right? So what we've done after that is that basically run a simple k-means clustering, and it became quite obvious that within this uh, uh, um, uh, video fragment that's close to ball delivery, there were certain clusters uh, uh, show, showing up very quickly, right? So we use this clustering technique and basically say, hey, if the video sequence is in this cluster, it means it's close to ball delivery. It's actually worked reasonably well to give us a general idea where we are, right? So again. Uh, um, quite an interesting, uh, interesting trick. And using this model was super easy. Actually, it's available on the TensorFlow Hub. So we basically just load it and then, you know, modify it uh, to to our needs, right? Or it's actually available on the GitHub as well. Um, and it's uh, uh, the model was done by the uh, Google's, you know, research AI research arm, uh, DeepMind or Alphabet, I guess, um, on research mind DeepMind. So a talented team, um, and they produce a lot of things uh, in open source. So what we've done is that we've how are we doing on time? Well, uh, what we've done with it is that we uh, took those approximate locations right here on the site, as you see, and we created a small HTML page with you know, basically a single page with some JavaScript embedded in it in order to allow us to you know, move second by second, frame by frame, and very quickly mark tag places in the video as a certain event, as a certain tag. Right? 
we actually uh, um, um, it's, uh, we're actually just going to open source it as available page so we could everybody could use it. But basically, we end up with those tags. So we went through the dozens and dozens of those uh, long form footage, uh, produces uh, produced few thousands of those uh, of those labels, and that basically split our time of a, uh, of a footage into a place where certain elements of a game happen, and specifically the, the time when this ball are running up and it's throwing the ball and the ball hit by a batsman, that's a thing that we focused on and basically made, it, made a, a binary classifier out of it again. Right? And what we've done with this is that we trained two models. One of them is that we basically took that kinetics data set based uh, I3D model, which producing 600 vectors. And we use those 600 as the input features into a simple classifier. I mean, we could have just you know, stripped additional layer on top of it and make it not you know, freeze training of, the, of, of that bit, bit. But in the end, you know, in any way you do it, we again use a transfer learning, right? Because the model already trained on this. And we turn it into the classification problem as opposed to kind of semi usable clustering, right? And we achieved a very high precision and recall pretty quickly on this in a high, uh, uh, very high 90s. Um, and we also built a frame classifier. I mean, we could have arguably taken the, the same approach by, um, by possibly taking a pre existing image you know, classification uh, uh, algorithm, pick important layers from it, and then retrain it for what we need, right? Fortunately, this product already exists, and it's called Google Cloud AutoML Vision, because it's exactly what it is. Right? So it's already pre-trained on a lot of the photos, and uh, we just need to additionally train it on the frames that we need. Right? So, um, and we basically merged those models together and made a decision uh, uh, and build a small microservice API. Uh, microservice API. Um, we, because it takes a long time you know, to go through several hours of HD video and, and, do the, and extract frames and apply these models, it needs to be asynchronous. But again, we were always thinking of as an, as an API that can be embedded in other systems, right? So the API here is that sending a message in a pub sub topic that gives us location of the video in a cloud, uh, cloud storage, right? There, there's a Kubernetes cluster that runs workers that auto scales based on a number of messages in a queue that picks up that video, goes through that with uh, um, OpenCV, extracts the frames. And feed those frames as uh, 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 into the um, um, kinetics-based model, and as well as uh, send some of the frames into the uh, Google uh, uh, AutoML vision, um, and then stitches, quote unquote, those two together, basically build a simple ensemble out of those, and uh, creates a, a JSON file uh, that it uh, puts in another uh, cloud pub sub topic. So. How this, this is embedded is that we send the message when the video is available, or we can automatically send the message in the pub sub queue when video is uploaded, for example. There's many ways we can, we can do it in the Google Cloud Platform. And then we just wait on the queue for the processing to finish, and we do whatever we need to do. In the beginning, we just created a, a small UI that will basically, in a similar fashion that I showed you as, uh, uh, with the labeling, it would. Uh, Kind of show us the label so that analysts could go through it and, and, and evaluate, you know, how well it's working, how well it's working. But another uh, another not shown here is that component that basically picks the video, uh, picks the JSON from a pub sub when the labels become available, and basically cuts the images in a small uh, in a small bits. Right, very very easy to do. So we have a full pipeline by taking a long form video and transforming it in a short form, uh, and it works pretty pretty slick. So. Um, When I was preparing for it, I was saying it would be really cool that Google introduced AutoML video because it just made sense because we would just do it in exactly the same way, right? Guess what? This morning it was announced that you know AutoML video intelligence is basically the same thing as Vision uh, AutoML, right? But works on the sequence of video, right, in exactly the same way. So what we could have done if it was available earlier, and um, is that we could have used that. Now, maybe it would work. Good enough on the videos that focused on people's movement, maybe not. Right? It still remains to be seen because kinetics is um, one that's been focused on 
predicting the, the, the people movement, right? Uh, 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 what people do and their actions, right? So it's, it, the, this domain transfer worked really well for us. Uh, uh, the transfer learning worked really well for us, but maybe, it, maybe it's too generic, right? But we would definitely try it, and I'm pretty sure we would get some good initial results, right? So it's great that we have availability of those. Even if we don't end up using them 100% at the end, it will already give us a very quick idea if it's possible or not, and we can you know, go to more complicated solutions um, as needed.